and so forth is uh, Stacy McGinnis. Local folks all know him as one of the vice presidents of Clarendon Bank. Anybody coming in who wants to do banking, go to <laughs> Bank of Clarendon. How's that for an advertisement? That's uh, great, George. I appreciate it. Okay, Stacy McGinnis. So I think everybody who works at the bank is the vice president. I believe that's the way that works. <laughs> um, I do want to welcome you to Clarendon County. Uh, how many of you do not live in Clarendon County? Let's see some hands. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, how many of you have who do not live in Clarendon County but have ties to Clarendon County? Raise your hand. So a few people coming back home a little bit. Well, good. We're glad to have you with, have you with us this weekend. And we hope this will be an enjoyable as well as an educational weekend for you. We're going to do a lot of neat things, particularly uh, tomorrow. We've got a lot of good speakers lined up today and tomorrow, and we hope you really have a good time and really enjoy uh, playing the county. Everyone should have a uh, packet that uh, George and Carol put together. And on the right-hand side of that, you'll see a list of our speakers and a little bit about them. Um, I'm not going to insult your ignorance by reading this to you. Uh, you can read it yourself, but I do just want to, when I introduce the people, at least just let you know who's coming up. Our first speaker today is uh, Frank Stovall. Frank is the manager of Musgrove Mill State Historic Site, and uh, he's going to present today about Musgrove Mill. So, uh, Frank, uh, appreciate you being with us today. I hope you can have a good presentation for us. Uh, I've never been filmed before, so I feel uh, a little camera shy. <laughs> and for those of you who know me, I really am Frank Soval. Everyone who, who knows me well has said, I don't recognize you without your park service uniform on. So I'm undercover and incognito today as a park ranger in front of you. Thanks for having me. I'm probably not going to take up the whole hour, but I want to talk to you a little bit about Musgrove Mill, the battle that occurred on Edward Musgrove's plantation in 1780 and some of the things that the Park Service is doing to protect and preserve that battlefield. I'm here to speak to you today about something that is very important to me and to many other people who reside in the state of South Carolina. It's our history and our heritage, and I don't think you'd be here today if that wasn't important to you. I want to tell you a story, one of heroism, of patriots, of Tories, and Redcoats, one of events that occurred in our state's own backyard. And I want to tell you how the Park Service, the agency I work for, is committed to protecting the hallowed ground in which this tale took place and on educating the public about the importance of the action that a small band of patriots took during a typically hot summer day in August of 1780. And I've discovered, as I get older, and I know I don't look that old, that I end up playing the trombone a little more when I read. So if you folks don't mind, I'm going to get close to my notes. There. Hmm? I need you to do me a favor. I need you to step back in time with me to 1780, to a time before motor cars, to a time before air conditioning, to a time before days in, and modern conveniences. Come with me for a minute back to the American Revolution. Now, I often find it very hard to believe that at one point in our nation's history, the area to the east of present day Greenville, in fact, even this area here in Clarendon County, was the frontier. This is the border in 1780 between the known and the unknown, between the civilized world and what many believe to be the uncivilized world, the backcountry. It was in this frontier world in present day Lawrence County that a gentleman named Edward Musgrove, a respected landowner, tax collector, and mill owner, lived. His grist mill on the banks of the Ennery River would witness a battle that would occur between Patriot forces and Tory supporters in August of 1780. And why were the British in his neck of the woods? Why were they in his neighborhood? Well, as we all know, British troops had intended to break the Patriot back by splitting New England in two and then destroy Patriot forces under the command of General George Washington. However, their plan didn't work. After the stunning American victory at Saratoga in 1777, 
the war in the northern colonies would become stalemate, and British forces made the decision to take the war to the south. One, because they felt that a majority of southerners were loyal to the crown, and secondly, because they wanted to save the very economically important and valuable to them southern colonies. At the time, South Carolina was the richest of the colonies and producing more income for England. In 1778, the British would capture Savannah with ease. In May of 1780, the British would capture Charleston and 5,000 American troops. And incidentally, that fall of Charlestown in 1780, that loss of 5,000 American troops, that would be the single largest surrender of American forces in history until 1943 and the Battle of Corregidor in the South Pacific Theater of World War II. All the British had to do at that point was move north, join forces with the British Army operating in the northern colonies, and cut the Americans off from one another. And lucky for us, that never happened. Instead, what the British would face for the next three years would be continued hardship and continued difficulties here in the Carolina backcountry at the hands of American patriots through small fights and big battles until they themselves would be forced to give up all control of the colonies. The war began coming apart for the British here in the interior of South Carolina. In 1780, this area was the frontier of America. It was the wild, wild west, a rugged, hard, lonely, and unforgiving wilderness it would see some of the bloodiest fighting of the American Revolution. Before the British Army could begin their march north, they had to solve a problem, a problem that all armies had faced throughout time. How do we move troops and also move with them food, medicine, clothing, supplies, and all the logistical needs that an army faces to move forward in the field? The farther north or the farther west that British troops moved, the further away they would get from their main supplies in Charlestown. To solve this problem, they built a string of forts across South Carolina at places that you heard of. <coughs> places like Rocky Mount, Hanging Rock, Camden, Sherraw, and 96. And from these outposts, Tories would fan out like the spokes on a child's bicycle wheel to guard other strategically important places, strategically important roads, strategically important bridges, ferries, mills, in fact, such as the Ford Mill that existed on Edward Musgrove's property. In 1780, Edward Musgrove was the owner of a pretty good-sized tract of land on the south side of the Inneree River. He was educated, he was influential, and he tried very hard to remain neutral during the conflict. Unfortunately for him, the British had other ideas. First, the grist mill on his property could be used to supply troops with meal and flour for food. And second, he had a known river crossing. Now in 1780, this is very important because there were very few good roads in the backcountry of South Carolina and even fewer decent places to cross rivers. Knowing where you could and could not cross a river safely and controlling that area would be of vital importance. And it was decided, British authorities, that there should be a garrison or force there at Musgrove's Mill. And on August 18th of 1780, the hills around the Musgrove home were alive with the sights and sounds of the 200 loyalists that were camped around it. I want to take a break here and talk about Everett Musgrove and divided loyalties. How many of you have heard of the Battle of Musgrove's Mill before I came here today? A few of you. How many of you have heard of Everett Musgrove? A few of you. Um, <coughs> a lot of history books we read, a lot of accounts we read the battle talk about Everett Musgrove being a Tory. Whether he was a Tory or a patriot, I'll tell you, I'm still not convinced either way. But I want to talk about it for a minute. Because Edward Musgrove had seen battle before. He had been involved in frontier wars with Native American tribes. He had actually commanded a fort near present-day Whitmire. It's actually very close to a recreation area called Molly's Rock, which is managed by the United States Forest Service. And he had seen firsthand the brutality of war in the Carolina backcountry during the colonial period. And by 1780, the American Revolution had been going on for five years. So it's not difficult to surmise that Mr. Musgrove was probably tired of war, of face-to-face -face war and of combat that was going on. 
The second issue that Edward Musgrove was facing when he began to debate whether or not to choose sides was what he had. He had journeyed to South Carolina with a land grant from the king and had set up a plantation on the Enery River. His brother had set up a farm on the Tiger River not too far away. <laughs> By 1780, he had a bustling farm, an operating grist mill. He was a tax collector. He was respected, educated, slaveholder, operating a very profitable little enterprise for himself there on the Enery River. To pick the wrong side could mean losing everything he had. And what we do know about Edward Musgrove was he was the type of guy who was more concerned about himself than the greater good. He was even contacted by Drayton during the er, prior to the war and, and asked to join the Patriot side. And in a letter, Musgrove responds to that by addressing the fact that if he was to choose the wrong side and fail in the endeavor, he would basically lose everything he owned. If he went off to fight with the Patriots, his neighboring Tories might burn his house and home down. And if he sided with the Tories, the Patriots may do the same to him. So he tried to maintain his neutrality throughout the war. Now, everybody has a morning routine. I get up in the morning, I fix a cup of coffee, I step out on my front porch, and I greet the day. And I don't know if that was Edward Musgrove's morning routine. But in August of 1780, regardless of what his morning routine was, he stepped outside and greeted the day. And although my day, living on a state park, comes with songbirds and nice sunrise and all the wonderful things that come with living in the country, Edward Musgrove's day came with 200 armed neighbors, Tories, who showed up and said something along the lines of, claim your home and land the name of the king. What do you think of that? He said, here's the keys. And I would too, because if you all show up on my property in the morning or to the teeth and say, we claim your land and property in the name of the Francis Marion Supposed, I'll be happy to give you the keys, coffee, you can even use my car, okay? Just don't worry. So that was the situation in August of 1780. Edward Musgrove's home becomes a British field hospital and command post for troops moving through the area. 200 Tories are there guarding the road crossing and the grist mill, and he and his family are still living on the property. Meanwhile, in August of 1780, some remnants of the Southern Army are camped near the North Carolina border. Most of these remnant men are militia, untrained volunteers, but not unskilled volunteers by this time. Several of the men were from the Lawrence County, South Carolina area, and they had learned of the Loyalist or Tory presence at Musgrove Mill. Now, sensing an opportunity, about 200 Patriots broke camp on the evening of August 18, 1780, and headed south for Musgrove's Mill. They were a very diverse group of men. They came from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. The South Carolinians were led by, I don't know if you guys can see the wind out here, but it is. Blowing things away. There were three flying down the I 95 <laughs> maybe 15 minutes ago. We're swing around and looking for a good sturdy table to go under if it gets real bad. Um, the South Carolinians were led by Colonel James Williams. Now, James Williams was from Lawrence County. He had a big plantation in Lawrence County. His family lived in Lawrence County. He would lose several sons to the war. He had a very vested interest in bringing a contingent of Patriot troops home to Lawrence County because he knew that his family may have been getting, feeling some of that Tory aggression on their homes and, and population. The Tennesseans, of course, were led by Colonel Isaac Shelby. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Shelby, but Shelby will become the first governor of the future Commonwealth of Kentucky. And that kind of tells you that he survived the Battle of Mill. The Georgians were led by Elijah Clark. If you've ever studied Georgia history, you know about Elijah Clark. Traveling at night to avoid being detected and to avoid the heat of Carolina summer, they arrived at an old Indian field that overlooked the Ennery River to the north of Edward Musgrove's plantation. They arrived very early in the morning of August 19, 1780. Now, I don't know how you guys feel after a long trip. I just got off a nine hour plane ride yesterday. I was exhausted. I didn't want to see another flight attendant or another piece of airline fit for a long time. 
I didn't want to see an airport or customs. I wanted to get in my car, come home, get a soft bed, a warm meal, and just relax. These guys spent about eight or nine hours on horseback over rough backcountry roads at night. They did not get a warm meal. They did not get a warm bed. That customs didn't hassle them either, but, um, <laughs> which was a plus. But they were exhausted, and now they had to face a possible battle against what they thought were 200 Tory troops. So the point by telling you the story is everyone in here has been on a long trip. Everyone in here knows how it feels to crawl out. I'm six foot two. I kind of spring out of the car when it stops. But um, everyone knows how it feels to crawl out of a car in an airplane seat after a long trip. You know the exhaustion that you feel. Imagine what these troops were feeling in 1780. Now the very first thing they did was to get a clear picture of the situation. Williams, Clark, and Shelby, who were sharing command of this detachment, sent a small unit out to assess their situation, to get some intelligence on the position and strength of loyalists. But before this could really be accomplished, those men in that small little unit that went out to gather intelligence encountered a loyalist patrol sent out to do the same thing. And a very brief skirmish broke out in which one of the loyalists was wounded. The Patriots had now lost the element of surprise. Now, at the same time, the Patriot commanders were receiving a little bit more bad news. You see, they peered over the ridge down to that valley, and they saw all the things that we talked about earlier, and the Musgrove's home, the 200 Tories, the mill. They saw other cook fires, too, and they were also informed by a local gentleman that an additional 300 British troops had moved up in the night to Musgrove's mill. These weren't Tories. These were British provincials. To make matters worse, they were under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Ennis. It's the real troops. And uh, this now brings the Tory number, the Tory British number, to 500. 500 British Tory troops versus 200 Patriot troops. The Patriots could not retreat because of the rigors of a 40 mile ride the previous night, but fighting or attacking such a superior force head on would be suicide. What they needed was a plan. The Patriots decided to form a line that straddled the main road behind Timber Ridge overlooking the Indian field. And they would wait there for the British to attack to bring the British up the road <coughs> fell onto a, a young Georgian officer. His name was Shadrach Inman and he and a small hand-picked group, hand group of men 10 to 12 to 15, depending on the accounts you read, mounted their horses, rode downhill into the British camps. You could almost imagine them kicking over cook pots and, and firing their guns into the air. And then they turned and retreated back up the hill towards the Patriot position. The British did what British troops did in 1780. They jumped up, formed three nice straight lines, crossed the river, and up the road they went to take care of this small little Patriot force. When the British got to within 70 yards of the Patriots, the Patriot forces opened fire. An initial volley, it really only did anything, it really didn't do anything to the British, but stunned them. They were quickly able to regroup and attack, and at this point it became a very pitched battle with both sides, British and Patriot, under very heavy fire. The turning point of the battle, and every battle has a turning point, came when the British were able to press within a few yards on the right side of the Patriot line. Seeing this, Colonel Elijah Clark sprung into action, shifted 40 men over to this side to reinforce the line, and <coughs> at nearly the very same time, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Ennis, the commander of British troops in the field, was shot. With that, with the loss of their leadership, with nearly every British officer wounded by this time, the British began to fall back. The Patriots, who had now done the impossible, moved a superior force off the field, chased them. Some accounts discussing chasing them all the way to Fort 96. Now, everyone in here has been to reenactments, or everyone in here has heard the, the unique report or sound that a weapon from this time period makes. And if you've been to a large reenactment, you've smelled that very unique smell of black powder weapons in use. While this entire battle is going on, while the British troops are going downhill back towards the Enery River, with the Patriot forces right behind them, 
there is one lone Patriot Post rider on the road who now hears this sound and who smells those smells and knows that he's too late. His job was to catch the Patriot force. In the middle of the battle, the rider shows up and catches Williams and Clark and Shelby and informs them that the Southern Army at Camden, under command, raise your gaze, was defeated three days earlier. What this means for these three Patriot commanders is number one, they're now one of the few effective fighting forces in South Carolina left. Number two, if they get in serious trouble, no one's coming to help them. And they're 52 miles behind enemy lines. That's an eight hour ride on horseback. The three Patriot commanders made a very wise decision to withdraw. Now, although they were unable to take the field, the battle is still a Patriot victory. Of the 500 British soldiers involved, I'm going to make sure I get these numbers right, more than 60 were killed and 70 were taken prisoner. That's 26% casualty rate. Of the 200 Patriots, only four were killed. It's a 2% casualty rate. One of those killed, however, unfortunately, was Captain Shadrach Inman. And he was buried on the field of battle. Even though this is a relatively small battle, I want to talk about why it's important and why we shouldn't underestimate the importance of small battles like Musgrove Mill. First of all, this is one of only a handful of incidents in the American Revolution where American militia forces are going to clearly defeat seasoned and trained British provincial troops. Secondly, the story at Musgrove Mill shows in very clear detail the style of fighting that militia troops in South Carolina were adopting after the fall of Charleston. This victory came after a very horrendous defeat of American forces at Camden and also at Fishing Creek. It gave American forces a needed boost in morale and the knowledge that backcountry forces could defeat the British. And these guys would use this knowledge and this boost in morale at a battle that I'm sure everyone in the room has heard of, King's Mountain. But what I find very interesting about Musgrove Mill is it clearly demonstrates that the American Revolution is not just a revolt. The American Revolution is really a civil war with neighbor against neighbor. I'm going to throw out a statistic here, and every time I throw out this statistic, somebody tells me a different statistic. So if you want to use your different statistic, feel free. Um, it really depends on which historian you read as to how you, get to how you come up with these numbers, and uh, these are just the numbers I use, so uh, don't kill the messenger. I want you to look around and pick five people in this room that you know. Now, out of those five people, try to pick the two that are patriots. Because in 1780, about any two out of five folks were siding on the patriot side. Have you picked them out? Pick out the one person out of the five folks you know that is only going to side with who is winning at the time. Okay? Keep going back and forth. All right? Pick out the other two who are Tories. Can you tell? You put in 1780, you get Because everyone's dressed differently. No one is in uniform in this room. You don't know who your Patriot friends are, who your Tory supporters are, or who the neutral person is. Musgrove Mill is a battle where you could very well be fighting the same people at your table or the person sitting next to you. Brother against brother, colonist against colonist. The park that we've developed at Musgrove Mill that the state has opened up uh, strives to serve really as a gateway to the American Revolution in South Carolina. Our visitor center, which is still in the process of development, however it is open to the public, um, I have good news, we just brought in some more contractors to finish another set of exhibits, so I'm elated about that. We can talk about that later if you like. Um, the purpose of our visitor center of exhibits is to really provide an introduction into South Carolina's role in the American Revolution. We're doing it because we believe in two things. First, historic events have to be presented in context. It makes more sense if you know what happened before and what happened after. And secondly, 
We are working within a project called the Cradle of Democracy, which some of you may have heard of. The Cradle of Democracy, we call it COD, it doesn't mean cash and delivery, is a partnership <laughs> among several organizations. It includes the South Carolina State Park Service, the agency I work for, uh, the National Park Service, um, Scott Withrow is here, mm -hmm. works with the folks at CalPens, and Palmetto Conservation Foundation, and a lot of other agencies and organizations in state government and private groups. And its purpose is simply to protect, preserve, and educate the public about the numerous revolutionary war sites that exist in the state. Well, how many sites are there? Well, this depends on the study you read. But I'll tell you this, let's look at it this way. Every county in the state saw some sort of revolutionary war action except for maybe Richland County. Now, Richland County being the seat of state government, I'm not entirely sure what we're fighting for. But <laughs> Musgrove Mill State Historic Site Services is the hub for that endeavor. We, we work with interested organizations statewide to try to support battlefield preservation in those counties. Um, some, I believe the National Park Service's number for battles in the American Revolution in South Carolina, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, is like 183 or 187. Some go all the way up to 250 plus battles in South Carolina. What I've tried to do for you today is, is to tell you the story of the Battle of Musgrove Mill and, and to try to impress upon you a little bit of the importance of saving some of these battlefields for generations to come. And I would be very remiss in my duties um, as, a, as a historian, as a preservationist, as a park manager, if I did not implore you, beg you, get down on my knees and plead with you to participate strongly in battlefield um, <coughs> preservation initiatives across the state. I would like for the two-fifths of you who are patriots to go home after this conference and <laughs> dig out your uniform and your tricorn hat and show up for the war. I would implore those of you who are neutral, and you know who you are, <laughs> to pick the winning side. <laughs> and I would beg those of you who are Tories to wake up because there is a war still going on in South Carolina, whether you realize it or not. And that war is to protect the sites, the battlefields, where the history that will be talked about today and tomorrow occurred. There are no hard figures on how quickly we lose American Revolutionary War battlefields in the United States. But the folks at Civil War Preservation Trust feel that they lose an acre of Civil War battlefield every 10 minutes. That's 365 days a year. I'm pretty sure that that figure would apply very well to American Revolutionary War sites on the East Coast as well. It means in the time it took me to talk to you today, somewhere, three acres of battlefield became something else. It became a parking lot, a shopping mall, a school, a government building, something. I urge you to become involved in the protection of battlefields in your areas of the state, in your hometown. I urge you to use the state and federal resources available to you to protect those battlefields. I urge you to support preservation initiatives and legislation and to let your elected leaders know how you feel about historic preservation, why you feel it's important, and how important it is to you. And I think together we can, to borrow a phrase from my colleagues at the National Park Service, we can make South Carolina a place where freedom's flame is ignited in the feet of all who tread on our state's hallowed ground. Thank you for having me today. I'll be happy to entertain any questions you have. Are there any questions for Frank? One down front. Right, or the 1780s roadbed, which is very pronounced throughout most of the sites, uh, that we are going to go back and do some landscape treatments too to try to restore it to a 1780 roadbed experience, appearance. And the southernmost bank of the Henry River, near the site where Edward Musgrove's first mill stood, is supported and shored up by a hand sacked rock wall that has survived very well since the 1700s to today. But the rest, the rest of the structures.
to us from um, Cal Penn's National Battlefield. I think, Scott, uh, this is your third year with us, isn't it? You've been with us all three years, so we're glad to, to have you back. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you. I do work at Cowpens Battlefield and not Kings Mountain, but uh, I'm not representing the uh, National Park over Kings Mountain, but uh, I'm going to talk about Kings Mountain today. Um, I grew up in western North Carolina, about uh, 15 miles from Cowpens and about 30 miles from Kings Mountain. And uh, I don't know if I wasn't listening. But I don't remember my high school teacher talking about either of them a lot. Uh, they had, uh, I had a textbook, and it was probably uh, printed somewhere. They didn't talk about the Southern Campaign a lot. So I don't remember uh, talking a lot about the, uh, those battles in high school. Uh, I did go to the uh, battlefields. Um, Cowpans was just a, a wide place in the road. And have all the uh, acreage they have now. Uh, they had only a, about an acre at the time. Uh, Keys Mountain had the old uh, Vista Center, which is still there. It's a, a stone structure and uh, very small, and they use it as offices today. So I do remember going when I was younger. Uh, my father always said, well, you had people in those battles those battles of the Battle of Kings Mountain. And I didn't know who those people were until I come to find out it was my fourth great grandfather. Regions and uh, hard to tell who was loyalist and who was unpatriotic. Of course, I always say that this was a Scotch Irish war. Uh, the Withrows were Scotch Irish. Uh, uh, they were known, of course, for their cabins that they had appropriated from the German and Scandinavians became a Scotch-Irish thing to build log cabins. Um, and uh, this is a picture of a young Scotch-Irish, mostly Scotch-Irish woman in the early 20th century. Uh, Scotch-Irish were, uh, one of the uh, British members of Parliament said that Cousin America has run off with a Presbyterian parson. And that's very true, because the Scotch-Irish and the Presbyterian Church were so, uh, that church was so important in the lives of the Scotch-Irish. And you hear that uh, some authors will say, well, the Scotch-Irish were just rednecks. Rednecks won the Battle of Kings Mountain. Well, the Presbyterian Church was a very moderating influence on the uh, Scotch-Irish, too. And uh, some were very much frontier people, but some were... Uh, believe a lot in education also. And education is very important among, among the uh, Scotch Irish. I always like the story of the Scotch Irish, which is probably a little bit prejudicial toward the Scotch Irish. But uh, the uh, the uh, Germans who came, with the first thing they would build would be a barn, and the English would build a house. And of course, you know what the Scotch Irish would build for still. <laughs> so, uh, this was a Scotch Irish war. You can't live out the German families either, and others, the French Huguenots, Francis Marion, but, uh, especially in the back country, it was a Scotch Irish war. I'm from Rutherford County, and uh, it was part of Old Tryon County until the uh, just before the Battle of Kings Mountain, uh, until it was divided in 1779 into Lincoln and Rutherford counties, and uh, this is down where parts of Lincoln County, North Carolina. Okay. Rutherford County is about halfway between Charlotte and Asheville, if that would give you a little better identity as to where it is. It was on the frontier then. Uh, we don't know where that fourth great-grandmother of, of mine is buried. We think she was buried at Britain Presbyterian Church. Uh, we can't find the uh, tombstone. I think it's been destroyed. Here from North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. So they wanted to be in South Carolina, so they're going to go around the Catawbas, and then they discovered they were off 10 miles. Yeah, yeah. So North Carolina gave York County, Cherokee, uh, 
to South Carolina to make up for the yeah. error. And that error, that area is called the new acquisition. The new acquisition, yes. Uh, those uh, new acquisition reenactors uh, come to Cowpants. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm president of that group. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Good. Well, you have to mention them. <laughs> well, uh, here is uh, Sergeant James Gray. Uh, there's an old uh, Methodist church called Gray's Chapel, and it's it's there near where James Gray settled after the battle. Uh, it's near where the uh, old mountain man crossed the uh, Green River, which flows into the broad, coming out of Polk County, North Carolina. Uh, you can't tell it by this picture, but the, the county line between Polk and Rutherford County, North Carolina, goes right down the middle of this church. <laughs> the middle of the church. The people from Polk County sit on one side, and the congregation from Rutherford County sits on the other. <laughs> But it's in that area where they, the over mountain men every year in their reenactment of the march stopped at this church in this, this area. Um, now, the over mountain men uh, I had some handouts here, and I only have 24, and I know some of you are challenging the over mountain men. And I'm glad Frank went before me because. Musgrove's Mill is so important as far as the Battle of Kings Mountain. That's when the Over Mountain men were were escaping from, you know, that far into enemy territory, as he said. And that's when they began to organize. And they went back to over the mountains to uh, Tennessee, Sycamore Shoals. Uh, there were men eventually came down from Abington, Virginia, and others. And, and this is when they organized it. In, in some ways, Musgrove's Mill is very much like the Hammond Store, that battle before the Battle of King's Mountain. How many of y'all have heard of Hammond Store? That's where, that's a lost site in, in uh, near Clinton, South Carolina, that uh, William Washington uh, really, um, uh, it was akin to to what uh, Tarleton did at the Waxhaws. He really cut up some, uh, some lawyers pretty good at Hammond store. And of course they knew that Morgan was in the area and came after, uh, Tarleton came after. Uh, well, uh, Kings Mountain is, is similar in that sense in that Ferguson came after these over mountain men that were treating and reorganizing. And he issued a decree uh, somewhere uh, warning that if they did not desist from their opposition to the British arms, and this is a famous statement, by the way, he would march his army over the mountains, hang their leaders, and lay their country waste with fire and sword. There is a um, an author, um, Wilma Dyke, who wrote a little booklet on the Battle of Kings Mountain, saying, um, "Titan with fire and sword," but this was not. Uh, the thing to say to these over mountain men <laughs> uh, got to their pride and it also threatened their homes and their families so they organized to come after and a lot of the uh, a lot of the first uh, conflict took place in Rutherford County North Carolina where I'm from this is Cane Creek and this is where my family was Cane Creek Valley um, this is where my family was living at the time Cane Creek you can't see down there, but uh, uh, there's stories about Marlin's Knob here. Uh, my, my father, a long time ago, and I on a hike up there. Uh, you can look down on the valley from that, uh, that knob. Uh, Revolutionary War soldiers, I think seven or eight, really, buried in that cemetery, including my great-grandfather, and also uh, fourth great-grandfather. Also, there's Thomas McCullough, who, who uh, died of his wounds on the way back from King's Mountain. And this is what it says on his uh, tombstone. Here lies the uh, body of uh, Lieutenant Thomas McCullough, belonging to Colonel Campbell's Regiment, Virginia, who lost his life in and for the honorable, just, and virtuous cause of liberty at the defeating of Colonel Ferguson's infamous company. 
<laughs> bandits at King's Mount. They spared no words there in describing Ferguson. In this battle, you find a lot of propaganda, a lot of harsh words on both sides. And it was very, uh, very civil war. And I'm going to give you a copy of this letter. But Ferguson also wrote a letter he sent out to all the loyalists in South Carolina in that area and North Carolina. And this is what he said. Unless you wish to be cut up by an inundation of barbarians, see, called the over mountain men barbarians, <laughs> who have begun by murdering an unarmed son before the aged father, and afterwards locked off his arms, I don't know when that occurred, <laughs> and who by their shocking cruelties and irregularities give the best proof of their cowardice and want of discipline. I say, if you wish to be pinioned, robbed and murdered, and see your wives and daughters in four days abused by the drags of mankind, <laughs> dregs of mankind, in short, if you wish or deserve to live and bear the name of men, grasp your arms in a moment and run to camp. The backwater men have crossed the mountain. See, he refers to them as backwater men, not the over mountain men. They've crossed the mountains, McDowell, Hampton, Shelby, and Cleveland are at their heads so that you will know what you have to depend upon. If you choose to be degraded forever and ever by a set of mongrels, say so at once and let your women turn their backs upon you and look out <laughs> for real men to protect them. <laughs> Signed, Pat Ferguson, Major 71st Regiment. So this was the atmosphere as Ferguson came into Rutherford County and uh, the historian of Rutherford County, Clarence uh, Griffin, says that uh, 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 Ferguson invaded Rutherford County. He set up camp at, uh, at uh, Gilbert Town, which was the early uh, courthouse in Rutherford County. Uh, this is a scene at Cane Creek, and uh, my family's log cabin was somewhere where that larger house is right there today. Uh, beautiful area. The over mountain men came in uh, on where this rails to trail is now on an old railroad line that runs through part of uh, Rutherford County. The road came pretty much there. They camped on a ridge. They, they commandeered the uh, uh, William Gilbert house. It's a little bit like Frank said. Uh, uh, who, who were the uh, uh, Musgroves? Were they uh, Tories or were they Wigs. Uh, well, who were the Gilberts? We don't think they were uh, loyalists. <coughs> William Gilbert was off in the colonial legislature at the time. And uh, they took over his house. His wife was there and uh, some of his children. So they took the house and the word spread that, well, uh, William Gilbert was a loyalist because of this. But uh, he wasn't, he was a uh, uh, exonerated of those, uh, of those uh, charges later. But Ferguson camped on this ridge here um, in se September 1780, and the mountain, over mountain men came and camped at the same site. Here is the house uh, of William Gilbert. Now, some people, it's not actually the uh, original house. Some people say part of the house is the original house. You see the ridge behind it here. This is Ferguson's ridge, and Ferguson's army would have camped here, and Ferguson, this was his headquarters here in the house um, at the time. Here's another picture. It doesn't seem like such a high ridge, but uh, uh, if you walk up it, it, it seems a little higher uh, going up there. This was Gilbert Town, where the house was, named after William Gilbert. Uh, and this was the county seat for Western North Carolina, for Rose County, which extended into what is today Greene County and about four different counties in, uh, in uh, Tennessee. So you can see why uh, some of the people in the Over Mountain area wanted to organize into the state of Franklin and later became Tennessee. That was a long way to come to the county seat. That was the county seat for a large area. 
in Western North Carolina going into what is today Tennessee. But very important in this, in this battle leading Kings Mountain, there was a, a major uh, Dunlap there. Uh, his is a story in itself. Let me move that over just a little bit. Major uh, James Dunlap uh, was wounded there at Cane Creek in a skirmish uh, with the Patriot forces uh, under Ferguson. And uh, they retreated further at the time, and he was uh, recuperated in a house there that they had again commandeered. And later, uh, poor old James Dunlap was down in um, 96 and was captured. Well, guess where he was brought uh, to again? He was brought back to Gilbert Town, and evidently, when he was there before, he was so uh, uh, outspoken in his defense of, of the, the king that somebody murdered him again when he was there at, uh, shot him in, while he was in bed there at the William Gilbert house. And so he's buried on the hill there. Queens Rangers of New Jersey, shot March 28, 1781. And by the way, the over mountain men, it took them about two weeks to march from Tennessee over the mountains to uh, Kings Mountain. And they camped at uh, Gilbert Town two or three days before um, Ferguson. It was snowing in September as they crossed Yellow Mountain uh, near Roan Mountain from Tennessee into North Carolina. There's about a um, number of inches of snow on the ground at that time. When, when the over mountain man in Ferguson left Gilbert Town, tracking him to Kings Mountain, they had to cross a number of little creeks. This is Mountain Creek where this dog was crossing. I was up on the bridge and he had to be crossing at the time. Uh, coming down, following the route, um, and I've, I have walked with them some each year, and I, I really enjoy doing that. You're looking back now at Triant Mountain. Polk County, North Carolina here, I-26. But this is the area in Polk County where the over mountain men uh, came pursuing uh, Ferguson. Ferguson took a little more of a northerly route. And, you know, they were thrown off. Uh, William Hill said they were thrown off by uh, James, uh, James Williams. Uh, uh, I've also heard that uh, Ferguson sent wagons further south also to throw them off. But they took a more southerly route in pursuit of Ferguson and camped at Cowpens the day before the Battle of Kings Mountain. So the Cowpens becomes a staging point for uh, the Battle of Kings Mountain. So although my fourth great grandfather didn't fight at Cowpens, he would have been there the night before the Battle of Kings Mountain. There are all sorts of kidnap stories and spy stories, and I've heard bunches of them, and I don't know which ones are true and which ones not. There's probably a nugget of truth in a lot of them, but here as they passed the, uh, there was a log cabin then, this was a later uh, Miller house. Uh, Ferguson uh, took his hostage, uh, young Andrew Miller, who was just a, uh, a teenager at the time, uh, across the Green River, uh, the over mountain man did near this point. And uh, here is uh, some scene or some scenes from some of the walks that they do each year. Um, I went on one with my wife one year and uh, I told her it's going to be about three miles, don't worry. But it turned out about seven. Oh. <laughs> That's the last one she's done. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's hard walking when you're when cars are coming and you're stepping off the pavement and back on again. So, uh, but some of the areas that are dirt roads now have been paved over in that area. And there are some really walking trails too on that. Uh, if you walk through the old Green River Road at Cowpens National Battlefield, you're walking down part of the original road. Um, up in the mountains of, um, near, um, near Limbo Gorge, that area, there's a trail that may approximate the original walking 
So there's some walking trails too. Um, I don't know a lot of people do the whole two weeks now. Maybe so. I've just walked part out of it. <coughs> Um, coming from Dow County into Rutherford County. Now, I have found over the years that when people talk about Kings Mountain, I used to pass by a huge mountain when I was young on Highway 74, which is now, well, of course now we have I-85. And you see that mountain over there, and it's Crowder's Mountain. It's part of the Kings Mountain range. There is a range of mountains there. Crowder's Mountain is the northernmost part. It gets really smaller as it goes um, south. Kings Mountain is one of the itself is one of the uh, smaller mountains. But I can imagine seeing Continental soldiers and redcoats all over Crowder's Mountain when I was young. This is Crowder's Mountain here, and uh, whoever that was there that day was looking off at Charlotte. You don't see that many clear days now where you can see Charlotte, but that's looking at Charlotte in the distance. And, uh, but, but Kings Mountain is not nearly that high. Looking at uh, Draper's book, he has an illustration in there that shows not really Kings Mountain, but Crowder's Mountain. And a lot of the old books carry pictures of Crowder's Mountain, not Kings Mountain in the illustration. Kings Mountain is this little low-lying mountain in the background not nearly as high. Uh, and this old building, Dr. Bobby Moss, uh, who authored the book on Kings Mountain, tells me that was the old post office and it was a log structure. And I took this picture back in the 70s and uh, it's been torn down and or moved many years ago. But this was on the road in the Kings Mountain. Of course you have the, a number of monuments up there today. And I, it, if you're there in October, uh, the 7th, 6th and 7th of the 7th, when it came in that afternoon, the battle's fall, they have some uh, activities going on in an encampment during that time. Now, what had happened? At, what happened at Kings Mountain? Well, we know that Ferguson lost and was killed there and was buried there, and we know it was very much a civil war, and we know that the aftermath was that it was very hard to recruit uh, loyalists after then. Patrick Ferguson was the only person there from the British Isles. The rest were Americans. Now some were provincials in the uh, uh, British Army, but many of the uh, Brit uh, on the British side uh, were uh, their American militia, uh, loyalist militia. And you could not tell them uh, apart um, if you just saw them out somewhere. But the British wore a sprig of uh, pine in their hats, and the Americans wore some kind of paper that they had in their hats to tell uh, each other apart. Why did Ferguson choose King's Mountain? Well, he was embarrassed by Musgrove Mill, Frank, I think, for one thing. He had to make some kind of statement. You know, there, we don't know why. Uh, the, one of the early stories was, well, he chose that because its name was King's Mountain. There was a family who lived there named King. And he chose it for King and God and country. Uh, that's maybe part of it. But uh, he, for one thing, he could not get back to Cornwallis. And he couldn't get a message to Cornwallis. Cornwallis was... A, in the hornet's nest at the time, which was Charlotte. And Charlotte was a small, uh, Charlotte town, a small village, surrounded by thick forests. And the Scotch-Irish and some of the German uh, militia had the roads really covered in and out of, um, out of Charlotte town. Uh, Tarleton was not far away, but Tarleton did not come to the aid of Ferguson. If he'd come to his aid, that might have been a different story, too. Uh, some people say he just procrastinated. Some people said he was ill. Uh, but for some reason, he didn't come to the aid of uh, Ferguson.
Ferguson, um, some of the historians said he was trying to escape the battle. Now the battle, the, the mountain, is sort of a long, flat mountain. And it's, it rises a little and is an upper, a higher point to that mountain. Well, this is why I think the British uh, lost. Uh, Ferguson uh, had sent six men up to that higher point to rally those men. They're running low on ammunition. Now, Draper and uh, Uzal Johnson, who was a, a, a doctor with the British, said that they ran out of ammunition at that point. Well, not at that point. Uh, he didn't know they were low on ammunition. And, and uh, Ferguson had two lines of men in the rear who had probably 18, uh, 18 shots apiece, 18 musket balls apiece. And they hadn't come into the battle yet. So he had to go up, send somebody up on the higher point to rally these men. He, he sent three or four men, and as soon as they got in their horses, they were shot out of the saddle. And so that left it to Ferguson to do that. As soon as he got in his horse, he was shot out of the saddle with uh, six or more musket balls. Uh, as he fell out of his saddle, and getting shot that many times, he would just, you know, plunge out of his saddle. And his foot caught in the stirrup, and he was dragged by his horse. Now, the horse, there was a road up. Uh, uh, the way they'd come up, there was a road. Um, and there was a, uh, uh, a huge rock there. Some of the rocks had been moved up there. I think this one's still there. And that's where he had his tent and his headquarters. And his horse pulled him down the hill beside that headquarters down and didn't stop until it got to the bottom of the hill. And that's exactly where he's buried, right? At that, pretty much that point where his horse stopped. Uh, buried there and um, I don't know how many people over the years have thrown stones on that grave thinking, well, this is Ferguson and we're throwing stones on the grave. When what it was was an old Scottish custom to put stones on the grave uh, to keep wolves out and predators out of the graves. I think that's 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 another group of slides. The Civil War, very much so, took place in Rutherford County. It uh, it hurt recruiting for. Uh, loyalists. Uh, at the Battle of Cowpens, later, one reason they said that um, uh, Tarleton rushed the attack was he thought a group of over mountain men were coming, <laughs> as it happened at Kings Mountain. What he didn't know, that some of those over mountain men were already there. Now, not that many that fought at Kings Mountain were at Cowpens later, but some of the same ones were. There were some who fought there. I've never figured out exactly how many fought at King's Mountain that fought at, at uh, Cowpens also. And uh, Hammond Store was a prelude to Cowpens as Musgrove Mill was to uh, King's Mountain. Um, but uh, I'll just end with that. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Uh, Ferguson had a silver whistle with which he directed his, his men. Uh, some people said he also had a conch, conch shell, uh, too. I'm not sure. There is one in a museum in Tennessee that they think maybe he had. But he, he had a silver whistle. He was very identifiable, and he wore a, a, a sort of a vest-like thing that day. And people knew who to look for. I knew what he looked like. Uh, the old mountain man did, but that silver whistle still exists, and it's private uh, ownership, and um, I'm not sure that they're going to put that on display. I've, I've heard that somebody has it in western North Carolina. His body was treated after the battle. Would you care to comment? Well, <laughs> Patrick Kelly said, oh, that's not true. I heard him speak at the Cowpens. Uh, his books are back there, I believe. Uh, that uh, uh, the Over Mountain Man did not uh, uh, urinate on 
on the body, and that uh, some of that story is just uh, false. Uh, at one point, the body was supposed to have been exhumed, and, uh, and I don't know what they were trying to find out, how many musket balls hit him or what, but uh, Patrick O'Kelly says that's not true either from what he's uh, learned, but, uh, but I'm not sure about that one. I think at one time maybe it was dug up. It's, I read one account that said it was a, the body was exhumed, uh, or at least that there was an archaeological type of dig, yeah. and that he was buried with his sword, which would indicate he was buried with honors, as opposed to. But I, I just didn't know what he knew about that. He had uh, two uh, mistresses there at the battle too. And, uh, one of the stories is that uh, uh, one of the uh, women, uh, Virginia Sal, I believe, one of them was buried with him. So they may have uh, been trying to find find out that too, uh, find out a number of things for that. So uh, I don't know. I, I, there was a story. I think it was in the 1930s that was supposed to have taken place. I've heard a number of stories on, on that, but I'm not sure the truth there. That a lot of times that the uh, the church that they were members of had an influence on whether they were going to be which side they were going to take whether or not they were going to show up. You know, there were a lot of loyalists around uh, Fair Forest Creek from that Baptist church there, but a lot of the Presbyterian churches were split. Uh, just because you're Scotch-Irish Presbyterian doesn't mean, you're, doesn't mean you're a patriot. And so you get a lot of, uh, after the war, you get a lot of Presbyterians who, who were loyalists who were not welcome back in their church. And so that's where all these Baptist and Methodist churches came from in South Carolina. Uh, is that they, they were they were forced out, and so uh, you know I think that's an element of it. And of course, those that took parole in Charleston, you know, they were with the re, with the revocation in essence of the parole, they were forced uh, into t into taking a side when they didn't want to at that point. It's I wish it was a nice easy answer. I don't think there is an easy answer to why they show up or don't or, or what it is about. I mean, you know, Sumter, to me, doesn't seem to be somebody I would have cared for, but yet he was obviously a really charismatic guy. I mean, if you can talk that many people into coming and getting their tails kicked uh, every time he leads them into battle, just about, you, you must be doing something right. <laughs> Accounts seem to be that when he goes out there, and he was doing this even from early in the revolution, he was notable for his recruiting ability. Yeah. Uh, people are willing to follow him. That, that's certainly true, yes. But his, his plunder practices must have been popular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Certainly people were able to get, up, uh, get some things that way. Yeah. Draper goes into great long lists of who got what when. Mm -hmm. And it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, of course, we've still got all these old leftover animosities. We've got, as you say, the greed, the opportunity to get some new stuff. Uh, upcountry, of course, was traditionally a turbulent place anyway. Uh, you don't need to have anything new going on to make you feel like being upset at somebody and doing something about it. Uh, still, I, I think what you're seeing here at the same time in the way these battles operate, something's going on that happens to to be the crystal around which things coalesce, and all of a sudden you've got a force in being that's able to do something of that nature, to strike like that, and to have an impact like that, and to disperse afterwards, and then to come back together. Not always the same people coming back together at the same time, and not always the same militia colonels leading them in at the same time, but you're going to find them coming back and forth like that. Yes, sir, back in the back. I think your, your two Western victories probably each had a colonel around which the, uh, the Patriot forces gathered. I think King's Mountain, as was pointed out by the speaker, the colonel that caused the gathering that time was Ferguson's threat to go over the mountain and burn, <laughs> burn, kill, and otherwise tear up the area. In the case of Calpins, I think the fact that you have Morgan and some of the Continental Line actually in the area probably caused a lot of the uh, the militia that was there to come out saying, okay, this time we've actually got some of the, the regular army. We've got one of the more charismatic, forceful 
commanders in the regular army. This is somebody we can go fight with. I mean, Morgan had been a rifleman, too. That probably didn't hurt any when you were talking about the, the men armed with rifles. And he had a reputation left over from Saratoga as a winner. I've never counted how many times I over mountain and mobilized, but I think it came to South Carolina at least three times. And would y'all comment on the role of General McDowell and the North Carolina rebel government that was obviously fully functional? Because mm -hmm. we've been focusing like these colonels just made this up on their own, but they had commissions and they were obviously answering, I guess, to General McDowell and they were answering to the rebel governor of North Carolina. William Shelby and Clark took their marching orders from the child. They made the request. I don't think they would have moved into South Carolina if they picked out on that. Not approved. Um, so they were, they were pretty clearly handled. 